that tone, uh, but hopefully this is going to change soon. <clears throat> the topic for this afternoon is the orbital tumors. Uh, it's a personal series, and as usual, we'll discuss the clinical, radiological, operative, pathological correlation. Uh, before I start, I'd like to take you through uh, some of the history of a neurosurgery in Jordan. This paper we published back in 2016. <clears throat> and uh, the first neurosurgeon in Jordan was Dr. Antoine Tarazi, uh, who uh, was born 1927. He died in 1999. Uh, that's the time when he was born, and this is the uh, Jerusalem where he lived. And this is the first uh, medical meeting in the Middle East back in Jerusalem, 1927. Uh, these are a group of uh, Palestinian ladies uh, in uh, the front of the uh, British Embassy. So Dr. Antoine Tarazi attended the Terrasanta College for Boys in Jerusalem, 1932. He was uh, at that time five years old. He's one of those boys uh, sitting down there. He excelled in, in his studies and also in music. And this is him. And this is the date, June 1938. <clears throat> When the war broke out in 1948, after the uh, United Nations partition plan, dividing Palestine into two states, the uh, Palestinian state in orange and the, uh, the yellow one for the uh, Israelis, uh, war broke down. And uh, Dr. Tuan Tarazi fled to Beirut, where he joined the American University of Beirut between 52 and 58. He got his medical degree from there. And then he left to Montreal neurosurgery and the department, he joined them there in 1958. And his mentors were including giants of neurosurgery at that time, William Cohn, Arthur Elbridge, Theodore Ram Asmussen, and Wilder Pinfield. And here he's with his uh, boss, William Cohn, at home, and with his uh, mentor, Theodore Ram 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 Asmussen. Uh, again, here he is in Montreal. He finished his studies and started teaching there. And one of his uh, people that he uh, actually taught is John Jane Sr. John Jane is a very senior neurosurgeon from uh, Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. And what he said about him is beautiful. He says, I have remained grateful for Dr. Tarazi's dedication to teaching and his influence has continued throughout my career finished his studies and training and teaching in, in Toronto and, uh, and, and then Montreal, sorry, and he went back to Jerusalem in 1961, where he established a neurosurgical unit at Augusta Victoria Hospital. And he was known to be firm and he would not tolerate any nonsense. Later, 2014, John Jane, the Jr wrote about him an article that was published in World in Neurosurgery, and he said, Antoine Terezi is the first Palestinian neurosurgeon and the first neurosurgeon in Jordan, a neurosurgeon of two countries, which was indeed the, the case. Uh, this is uh, back in uh, 1966, and Jerusalem hosted the first Middle East neurosurgical conference. Imagine that, 1966, the first neurosurgical meeting of a neurosurgery in, in Jerusalem. Dr. Antoine Tarazi died in 1999, and uh, he alone served the 3 million population, performing 5,000 surgeries. Last one was on the day before he died. I raise my hat for this man because he really was a genius. Back to our topic, orbital tumors, personal series. <clears throat> Let's talk about orbital anatomy. This is some of Leonardo da Vinci anatomical drawings. He was so much interested in that. And this is the, the frontal view of the orbit. Uh, this is the true uh, skull, cadaveric skull. And we speak about the rule of seven in the orbit, seven bones, seven arteries, seven veins, seven nerves. So for the bones, the roof is the uh, frontal uh, orbital blade. For the lateral wall, the greater wing of sphenoid, as you can see it here and in here. 
the medial orbital wall is made of lacrimal bone and ethmoidal bone, lacrimal bone and ethmoidal bone. And the inferior wall is made by the maxillary bone. And little bit backwards here between the junction of the floor and the medial wall is a little bit of palatine bone. So when you look at the right orbit, <clears throat> this is the severe orbital fissure, which is between the lizard wing and the greater wing of the sphenoid. And within the lizard wing, there is the uh, optic canal. So optic canal is a canal within the lizard wing. And this is optic strut. Left side, the same, severe orbital fissure between lizard wing and the greater wing of a sphenoid. Optic canal is here and here, and this is the optic strut. So if we take the right eye, we look at the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle. Uh, this is the orbital part and this is the palpebral part. And if you go deeper, then you will see uh, the vater palpebri uh, superioris muscle going into the upper tarsal bone. Uh, the vater palpebri is sitting on top of the uh, several rectus. Of course, this is the upper tarsal plate and this is the lower tarsal plate. So when we look at the levator palpebri superioris sitting on top of the severe rectus, the levator palpebri will go and insert itself into the uh, upper tarsal plate. And from it, a small muscle called molar muscle, which is supplied by the sympathetic chain. So levator palpebri is supplied by the oculomotor and the molar muscle is supplied by sympathetic. Both will actually elevate the eyelid. Any damage to any one of them will cause ptosis. So here we are, the levator palpebrae and the molar muscle. Again, looking at the levator palpebrae on top of the severe rectus, this is here the severe oblique and the lateral medial inferior and inferior oblique, inferior rectus and inferior oblique. Here in motion, the same arrangement of muscles. And going back, you'll see the uh, origin of these muscles from annulus of Zen. So these muscles are arising from the annulus of Zen, which is like this, uh, arising uh, at the severe orbital fissure. So here we are looking for the levator on top of the superior rectus, severe oblique, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and lateral rectus. Now this is looking at the uh, roof of the orbit, uh, which is, as we said, is the orbital plate of the frontal bone. Uh, this is on the right side. So you will see the bone here. Once you remove the bone, you will get the periorbita. And if the periorbita is transparent, you will see the frontal branch of V1, which has, as you know, three branches, the frontal branch, the lacrimal branch, and the mesociliary branches. <clears throat> remove the very orbiter and then you will see the same picture, the frontal branch on top of the levator, which is on top of the superior rectus. And you have two compartments, the medial compartment and the lateral compartment. Here we are looking at the medial compartment. You see medial rectus here, and you can see the branches arising here from the thalamic artery going this way. These are the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries. If you pull this way, you'll see the lateral compartment, you'll see the optic nerve, you'll see the thalamic artery, and you'll see the central lateral artery. So here we are, if you remove the top muscles, then you will see the same picture which I described, optic nerve going to the globe, the ophthalmic artery branches medially, anterior and posterior thmoidal artery, ciliary arteries, and central lateral. So here we are looking at the globe like this, and we are speaking about intraconal space, which is between the cone of muscles. So this is the intraconal space. Outside that is extraconal, and we are speaking here about the fat, like the lacrimal gland and other structures. If we go to the orbit from laterally, remove the bone, and then you'll get to the periorbita. We are on the left side. Again, here is the orbita, and you can see that here we have this orbital fissure. Remove the periorbita, and you will see the lateral rectus muscle, the inferior rectus muscle. 
the roof of the orbit, and here is the severe orbital fissure. And as we said, severe orbital fissure, this is the annulus of Zen from which the muscles arise. And they leave this space in the severe orbital fissure for these structures, lacrimal nerve, frontal nerve, and trochlear nerve, in addition to a severe orbital vein to be outside the annulus of Zen. So again, here we are dislocating the severe orbital fissure to see the structures passing through like this. You'll find all these nerves passing through tendon uh, annulus of Zen, uh, except the three structures which I mentioned outside the annulus of Zen through the severe orbital fissure. Now looking from above, superior view, again, here is the uh, anterior clinoid and underneath here is the severe orbital fissure. So this very important relation here of the anterior clinoid in relation to the severe orbital fissure and the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this is the anterior clinoid process and this is the severe orbital fissure here. This is the falciform ligament uh, overlying the uh, intracranial part of the optic nerve. So if you take the dura off, you can drill uh, the anterior clinoid. Anterior clinoid can be drilled intradurally, extradurally, or both. The orbital lesions now, having uh, gone through the anatomy, what are the orbital lesions that one would expect to face? Uh, let's say this. We have tumors, inflammation, infection, congenital, vascular. These are all pathologies. And we have something called orbital diseases. That includes idiopathic orbital pseudotumor, thyroid ophthalmopathy, lymphoproliferative disorders, Wagner granuloma, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, IgGG4, and Mikulic disease. So, speaking about two compartments, two groups, one includes the tumor's inflammation, the congenital vascular, and the other are the diseases. Let's see the orbital tumors. If we look at the adult orbital tumors, uh, malignant lymphoma and lymphoid hyperplasia are the commonest. And in this paper from Poland, 2014, a study about 122 patients, 56 were malignant in adults. If you look at the pediatric orbital tumors, dermoid cyst, optic gliomas, and cavernous hemangioma or cavernoma. If we look here, 30 pediatric patients uh, that have been published back in 2003, optical glioma, communist meningioma, and cavernoma. So primary orbital tumors in children, 80% are benign and 20% are malignant, which is the contrast to the others, where mostly 80% are malignant. So let's speak about the uh, benign ones, cavernomas. And 80% of these cavernomas are intracormal, as you can see. This is published from India, 2007. But it can also be an intraosseous, not within the cone of muscles, but within the bone. So intraosseous cavernomas. Can they be bilateral? Yes, they can. You can see this publication showing you bilateral uh, cavernoma or cavernous hemangioma from Italy, 2007. The other common tumor uh, in the orbit, especially in children, is the optical glioma. And you can see here that this constitutes really a major differential diagnosis issue. Meningioma, intraorbital the so-called the tram train track uh, sign, or this one, this one, and this one again here, this one looks very much like the optic nerve glioma. Lymphoma, they love to go to the orbit and they love to go to the adenexy. They love to go extra conal. <clears throat> Metastasis of the orbit from various primaries. Other tumors include osteoma, osteoblastoma, amyloblastoma, osteosarcoma, giant cell tumor, 
aan het rap doen, maar je zal komen. Zijn er niet het carcinoma, aan de franchise het carcinoma, adeno carcinoma, clavus cordoma, chondrosarcoma, angiofibroma, en others. Cyanonasal, fibrous fibroma, which is benign, retinoblastoma, malignant, chondromaxoid fibroma, seizure neuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Am I making things difficult? No, these are real cases. And when you face an orbital lesion, you have to have this uh, picture of what are the lesions that can be there so that you would limit your differential diagnosis. And when you want to treat, you know what to treat and how to treat. Lacrimal gland tumors, various types of tumors. Tumor could be extending from other place like uh, sphenoorbital orbital meningioma. So this started here, sphenoorbital orbit, sphenoid, and then went into the orbit. Or it is, could be extension from the tetra adenoma. This is one case of mine, the tumor extended totally into the orbit. Or tumor of the sinuses, extending into the orbit. So this is just a clinical picture of intraorbital tumor. Again, when you look at this picture, this could be anything. It could be tumor, it could be inflammation, it could be so many things. Infection, be it orbital cellulitis, fungal infection, mucosy, or a kind of cocos granulosis. Again, it will give you a picture of cellulitis which looks like a tumor, for example. Dermoid is one of the common tumors in the orbit. Let's come down to the other group, the orbital diseases. And the commonest, as you know, is the idiopathic orbital inflammation or pseudotumor orbit. And this is really a good name because when you look at this, you would diagnose a tumor. So it's not always like this. It's sometimes like this. And this is a dilemma of diagnosis, what to do with these cases. Again, various pictures of uh, idiopathic orbital inflammation. And look at this. It affects the dacroadenitis, uh, scleritis, ethmoiditis, Stills uh, syndrome, bilateral Chigoglin syndrome, Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which constitute of optic neuritis and uh, pericarotid infiltration scleritis, and perineuritis. Again, any of these you can face, and then you would have this dilemma of what is this lesion? What am I going to do with it? Again, this is pseudotumor. What difference does it make from other regions that we have seen? Thyroid orbitopathy is still there. We still see cases, and it is usually thickened muscles, thickened adenexia, etc. that again, you have to diagnose well thyroid or bitopathy. And others, other diseases, the orbital sarcoidosis, the histocytosis, the JN cell granuloma can be there. This is actually a case of mine and I will refer to it later. Other diseases that can affect the orbit are Bages disease, aneurysmal bone cysts, fatty meningitis hypertrophic, and look at this. It looks like a meningioma and fibrous dysplasia. Uh, something that we keep forgetting about is the leptomeningeal cysts or the uh, cases that are hidden because if in this case going into the orbit like this, you would diagnose a tumor. So this little boy from Palestine came to us with this. He was diagnosed as a tumor. It was actually a leptomeningeal cyst following the trauma that he sustained as, uh, as a very young uh, infant. So this is after surgery. <clears throat> Another case of leptomeningeal cyst is this, again referred to me as a tumor. But again, you can see the fracture here, and this was a leptomeningeal cyst. You can see the proptosis, and the diagnosis was uh, correct, and we rectified the matter completely. Another case of leptomeningeal cyst, again presenting as a tumor, and post operative. Swinoma of oculomotor nerve, what am I showing this? Because 
when I present to you some of the illustrative cases, one case of mine that I'm going to present looks very much like this. It could be schwannoma of ochromotor nerve. It could be optic nerve glioma. It could be uh, uh, meningioma at the orbital apex. What about orbital radiology? Of course, we do CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, FDG PET scan, PET CT scan, PET MRI scan, or SPECT. When you do your CT scan, this is what you call Frankfurt line. As a line passing through the greater wings of a sphenoid. So this is the greater wing of this line. And then you know exactly what's going, what's happening here. Anterior to this line, and back again, and anterior to this line, then you can divide the spaces into superior lateral, superior medial, and inferior. And then you can locate your lesion. You would say it is in A or B or C. MRI not only would help you with all the sequences, but also you can use the Fiesta sequence so that you can see the whole length of the optic nerve. Nuclear medicine inspect would give the give you some help. Angiogram in cases of the orbit is mandatory, especially when you are dealing with the, uh, <coughs> lesions that can affect the ophthalmic artery. Uh, you can use the images to do the proptosis index with the line that I mentioned and another line passing through the posterior aspect of the globes. Like this, you can tell whether there is any proptosis. <coughs> So this is proptosis index. So what is the treatment? The team that will deal with orbital lesions, orbital tumors in general, is a really team. It includes an ophthalmologist, oculoplastic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, maxillofacial, ENT surgeon, oncologist, interventional radiologist, radiotherapist, and internist. So it's a teamwork. And we do the investigations ophthalmologically for patients. Uh, pre and post surgery. What about surgery itself? Surgical approaches are not determined by just uh, thinking of what am I going to do today? Let me change the tactics. No, it is determined by the lesion size, the location. So you have the transconjunctival, the supraorbital, the lateral orbitotomy, the transcranial, transantral, and endoscopy techniques. In general, if trying to make this simple, surgical approaches are preferred by ophthalmologists, transconjunctival, and lateral orbitotomy. While the surgical approaches preferred by the neurosurgeons are the transcranial and the lateral orbitotomy. So basically, ophthalmologists love transconjunctival, neurosurgeons love transcranial, both they love to do the lateral orbitotomy. <clears throat> What is the aim of surgery here? It is in block total removal with the preservation of a neurovascular structure and protection of the glue. That's the aim. Anterior approaches, which is preferred by the ophthalmologist and oculoplastic surgeon, is the transconjunctival. Uh, you can see here we are on the right side. You can cut the uh, uh, medial cantal ligament, proceed, and then you can see the anterior ophthalmoidal artery. So you can actually get into the orbit from here. Uh, this is the transconjunctival approach. As such, medial rectus, protracted, and then you can take the tumor out and close it. Transconjunctival uh, application uh, from South Korea. Again, here they're using the uh, uh, cooling uh, device to take the tumor out. Transconjunctival approach for these intraorbital tumors from Turkey. This is the cryobrobe. Cryo cryobrobe, I used it, it's nice. It can really get stuck to the tumor and then you can uh, pull it out. But the uh, surgical and neurosurgical approaches to the, to the brain, to the orbit, uh, I must mention the, and single out one name, uh, Joseph Maroon from Lebanon, who, was, uh, who lived there all his life in the States. 
is well-known uh, orbital surgeon, and he published, if you look at the um, papers, most of the papers published on the orbit is published by Joseph Maron. So this is the transcranial front orbital zygomatic of the left orbit, so-called the Kronlin approach. As you can see, you go to the lateral orbit and open it up. And then once you open it, you can put many screws to fix it back. So this is a picture of it. Again, from Turkey, the same thing for the lateral orbitotomy. And uh, I think this is from Iran with this uh, lateral orbitotomy incision and excision of orbital tumor. Endoscopy is uh, getting hold of the future. And I believe, as I always say, endoscopy is the future of neurosurgery. And orbital lesions are now can be uh, removed through endoscopy. That started just as for biopsies, but developed into excision of a small and then large benign lesions. Uh, look at this paper from Japan. Endoscopic transnasal approach. So they call it this way, either through the frontal sinus or the ophthalmoidal sinus, it can go into various parts of the orbit. So transfrontal sinus, transethmoidal approach, uh, between certain uh, structures, our transmaxillary approach. So here you are, one of those cases. You can go to the orbit through the ethmoid. Uh, this is a rather recent paper from the United States, 2015, including the giants of endoscopy, Snyderman, uh, Gardner, uh, Miranda, and others. Uh, and with them, notice uh, Joseph Maron. So he, the, the, the neurosurgeon is joining forces with the endoscopist. Does that give us the best uh, approach to the orbit? So they say this is round the clock surgical access to orbit where you can gain access to any part of the orbit. And they can give you examples like this, going to the middle rectus here and taking the tumor out. So round the clock. What about radiation? Radiation is not used up front. It is used only for residual or recurrence of tumors after surgery. Uh, two points of opinion, or two different opinions. One is a proponent of radiotherapy. They say once there's a residual, hit it with radiotherapy, five years progression survival is significantly improved with radiation. So don't wait. If you have residual, give radiation. That was published in Radiation Oncology 2004. Others, published 2015, the delaying radiotherapy does not compromise the overall patient survival. So you can wait or give radiation immediately. Radiation, different forms, external beam, intensely modulated, intensity therapy, brachytherapy, proton beam, or gamma light. And this is a picture of proton beam <clears throat> given for this orbital lesion. Chemotherapy, pancreastine, actinomycin, cyclophosphamide is used for malignant tumors, especially those of the uh, lacrimal gland. Is there a place for um, fine needle aspiration? Yes. And it is very important diagnostic examination that should be performed whenever there is no contraindication. And many people in Jordan are using the fine needle aspiration to uh, get biopsies of tumors. Now to my series, between 85 and 2018, I had the uh, pleasure of dealing with these cases, 126 cases, mostly females, more females than males actually. And the benign tumors were 72, malignant tumors were 28, and others, as you will see later, 26. Some of the cases, this case of orbit cavernoma, and this man, 30 year old, and you can see the cavernoma here, it's intraconal, this is preoperative, and here is the postoperative, and there's no tumor, this is preop, this is postoperative. 
43-year-old female patient from Syria with this dermoid tumor, intraconal, again, before and after surgery. Uh, dermoid tumor of the right orbit. This man, 40-year-old man from uh, Libya, post-operative. This boy from Iraq with this fibrous dysplasia involving the orbit, and this is post-operative. Now we'll come to an illustrative case with some videos. And I'll give the chair to my daughter, the Dr. Asil Sveh. Hello, everyone from beautiful Amman. This is me, Asil Sveh. I'm a fifth year trainee in neurosurgery in Amman, Jordan. And I'll be presenting our case for today. Our patient was a 31 year old female patient from Jordan. She presented with a three month duration of uh, right eye, decreased visual acuity and difficulty reading. In addition to intermittent throbbing sensation in the right eye and headache. Uh, her past medical history was not significant. She had a past surgical history of C-section. Vital signs were okay. Upon the general examination, it was very uh, evident that she had proptosis in her right eye and proptosis is actually can be um, assessed both objectively and subjectively for very large uh, cases, very um, evident proptosis. It can be appreciated by just looking at the patient. And usually we look from above the patient so we can compare both eye, go uh, um, eye globes. And our uh, fellow ophthalmologists can actually use our um, ex ex exophthalmometer which actually measures uh, the exact uh, di dimensions. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the distance between the lateral orbit and the cornea. Uh, usually it's between 14 and 21 millimeters. Anything above that could be considered proptosis. Uh, regarding her extraocular muscle movement, it was okay. She had no limitation regarding that. And we can see the proptosis here, it's evident. Here, we can compare both eyes. Uh, her general exam was okay. She had no uh, cranial nerve deficits. Other neuro examination were okay. Regarding her right eye, obviously it's, we're talking about orbital tumors and she had a proptosis. We should think of uh, an orbital pathology especially with, when it's a unilateral proptosis. And her uh, eye examination was significant and she had uh, extremely decreased visual acuity in the right eye, decreased uh, sensation to, to light, and her fundoscopy showed optic atrophy in comparison to her left eye, which was rather normal. She had no nystagmus and uh, she had a, a um, rapid papillary uh, defect, which, uh, which goes with the decreased visual acuity. Regarding her upper and lower limbs, it was fine. She had um, rather um, hyperreflexia in both of her lower limbs, which could be due to anxiety. She had no pronator drift here. Regarding her lab values, she had uh, leukocytosis. Uh, could be explained by the decadron that that she was taken, and it could should be confirmed by lift shift. No other abnormalities. Urea mildly increased could be due to dehydration. And because the differential diagnosis is wide, we had to exclude some of the systematic uh, causes that may explain her. Uh, pathology. So we did the serum protein electrophoresis, which was okay. And we did the Bins jones protein spot urine for the uh, multiple myeloma and or plasma cytoma and which was negative. Preoperative imaging, we start with the CT. This is the soft tissue window and we can here see the very obvious 
um, invasion of the sphenoid uh, wing and the anterior clinoid. Going to the bone window, we can see the bone destruction here in comparison to the left side here. The superior orbital fissure here is okay. Here it's widened and the bony ridges are thinned. Same thing here. Now coming to the MRI, we can appreciate the lesion here, which is um, compressing her optic nerve, explaining the findings regarding her vision. Here's the lesion. Here's the lesion with contrast. And here is the very um, important piece of information is the um, relationship of the lesion uh, with the ophthalmic artery. We can see here it's completely obliterating the ophthalmic artery here in comparison to the uh, normal one on the, on the left side. See the lesion here on coronal cuts. Cervical cuts. And obviously the MRA and the MRV are part of our investigations for every patient. And here we, uh, we couldn't really assess for the um, vascularization of, of the tumor in comparison with the ophthalmic artery. So we did a conventional angiogram. This is her internal carotid. And here we can see that there is a vessel going to the to the lesion from the ophthalmic artery and the venous um, drainage from the lesion going into the cavernous sinus. All that should be known before going into surgery. And we did a bone scan that showed a focal increase uptake in the sphenoid wing corresponding to the uh, to the lesion. Pre-op investigations, it was okay. We did a visual evoked potential because she had a decreased visual acuity. And the visual evoked potential is particularly of use in these patients to assess and have a, a really uh, precise um, assessment of her vision. We consulted the oncology because we tried to spare her of going into surgery. So we tried to uh, give her the cortrop and the endomethacine and assess for her um, uh, response to, to it if, if she was having a histocytosis, but she had no improvement to, to her condition. So we, ex so we excluded the histocytosis X from our differential. The ophthalmology, as we said, she had right optic disc atrophy and decreased visual acuity in the right eye. Relative afferent papillary defect, which corresponds with the decreased visual acuity and the OCT, she had thinning of the retinal nerve fibers in the right eye, which goes with chronic compression of the right optic nerve. This is her visual field of the right eye. This is the left eye, which was normal. OCT here, OCT here. we can see the thinning of the uh, nerve fiber layer in the right eye. And our anesthesia consultation, which gave her the ACA grade two. Consent form, we always talk about it, which is um, tailor-made for each patient. And now going to the surgery, thank you. Okay. Uh, this arm, um taking you through steps of the surgery. On the right side, this is the incision. Uh, so this is the flab, elevating the flab. This is the frontal dura, this is the temporal dura. So once you retract it, this is the cadaveric. And uh, when you retract it, you can drill the uh, Sphenoid wing. Here we are doing that, drilling the sphenoid wing so that we can have a better view of the uh, roof and the lateral wall of the orbit. Of course, with drilling, you have to use lots of copious uh, watering to prevent any heat uh, damage. Once that is done, then you can 
the roof, the orbit. This is the taking the bone of the roof of the orbit, and this is the uh, periorbital. So frontal, temporal. This is the periorbital, having removed the bone from the roof of the orbit and the lateral wall. And then having done that, you open the dura. And then here, you can see the uh, optic nerve here. This is anterior clinoid. We do incision here over the dura so that we can drill intradurally. We drilled out extradurally, and now we are drilling intradurally. As we have seen in the pictures, most of the anterior clinoid is gone, but there are remnants of bone that we want to remove so that we can have a clear idea about the uh, lesion. Here is the removal of the last piece of the uh, anterior clinoid, which is usually the most delicate one. Here we are opening, slitting up in the optic canal. So this is the subarachnoid part and this is the optic canal. And at the end of the day, you'll have the optic nerve, the carotid drilling of the anterior clinoid. The whole thing is opened up for you. This is frontal and this is the superficial middle cerebral vein going into this phenoparietal sinus. Uh, sometimes you want to be sure that the tumor is not uh, infiltrating the lateral rectus muscle, so you can actually do the a little bit of pulling on the uh, exposed muscle as such. Once that's closed, once you finish, you close. Let's see the uh, surgery now in motion as a video. Can you see the video? Uh, right now, we can't see it. OK. Is it OK? Yes. So we are drilling the sphenoid wing. Now the roofing of the orbit, frontal and temporal, optic canal is here. Having done the extradural drilling and the roofing of the orbit, I open the dura. Again, frontal and temporal coming to the anterior clinoid intracranially. Concise the dura over whatever is left of the bony anterior clinoid. And then start with the drilling and opening completely of the optic canal. Now we are coming closer to the lesion. But we continue taking the bone. Here we have to avoid opening into the ethmoid sinuses. So you can see the, the optic nerve, the optic canal being opened. Here is the opening of the falciform ligament and the optic canal, the dura over the optic canal. You can see the bone here is fragile. Opening the optic canal fully. So we are coming to the lesion now. Removing it piece by piece. And 
And here in a minute, you'll, you'll see that I will get the frontal nerve uh, jumping on top of the lesion. I use the ultrasonic aspirator. So you can see the frontal nerve, which is a branch of V1. Here I'm completing the opening of the dura of the optic canal. Continue with the drilling. As I said, this is the last piece of the anterior clinoid. Now this is very important because here you are uh, on the roof of the cavernous sinus and underneath you is the clinoid segment of the carotid. Sometimes the anterior clinoid tip is so pointed out that it is really sometimes even dangerous to remove it. But if you are happy and things are going well, continue. It's very much adherent to the tip. So here you can see the clinoidal segment of the carotid. Here is the optic nerve. Here is the intracranial part of the carotid here. I'm putting the, the dissector here in the kilometer triangle here. This is the carotid. Now holding the, the legion, and this is the frontal nerve. So I work on this side of the legion using the ultrasonic aspirator. Now when I'm doing this, it is in my mind that I am tackling the, uh, the nerves and tackling the uh, the greater percopri superioris also. So edema and things like that may cause some tosis uh, post-operatively. But my aim here is to achieve radical excision and not just taking the uh, biopsy. So we are trying to deliver the lesion from the surrounding structures. So this is the tumor being removed totally. Here's the carotid. I'm working between the carotid and the optic nerve to make sure that there's no problem there. And literally here, you can see the third nerve here. I'm taking the arachnoid off to see the posterior communicating artery. So the whole anatomy is in front of you, as I said. And this is the superficial middle cerebral vein going to the sphenoparietal sinus. The tumor from the orbital apex has been removed. Histopathology was carried out by our histopathologist, Dr. Hussam of Farsa, who's American boarded, and he diagnosed cavernous hemangioma or cavernoma, a typical picture of the uh, cavernoma, with the full immunostaining. First operative, she woke up well, but she had complete ptosis, which is, to me, was expected. I was not worried. I knew that I preserved every nerve and uh, muscle there. So I thought that this is a matter of time. Once the edema subsides, she will get better. I reassured her and her husband. This is herself. And we do the um, uh, post-operative MRI the following day. 
and you can see that the apex is free of any tumor. On with the CT scan, you can see that we were there. Um, you can see here that the, we drilled well the anterior clinoid. So this is the anterior clinoid on the left side. This is the anterior clinoid that we removed from the right side. You can see the optic canal here. On the left end, you can see the optic canal being opened here. A discharge summary, detailed, not just a simple piece, piece of paper, and detailing everything that we have done to the patient in numbers and figures. 10, 15, 20 pages. That's our routine. Uh, follow up of the patient showed no tumor recurrence whatsoever. And what was really very, very nice is the full uh, visual recovery in this patient. She came back to normal visual function. So this is the patient. Extraocular movements back now. The toes is completely disappeared because it was just edema of the muscles and manipulation of the nerves. The other case that I want to show a video of is this um, 35 year old male patient with this tumor that is really uh, pushing the optic nerve. As you can see, we did surgery for. This is very uh, short uh, video, so we'll be finishing very soon. There's no hurry. Okay, the video is not showing yet. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So I use here the lateral orbitotomy, and I decided from the images that I'm going to go between the severe rectus and the lateral rectus, um, just drilling the uh, lateral wall of the orbit. Now I'm using the uh, navigation to make sure that I'm there. I'm going through the anterior orbiter. Again, it is your anatomical knowledge that is guiding you, not the navigator. It is real study of the images before surgery and the exquisite knowledge of the orbital anatomy. So I'm going between the, uh, the severe rectus and the lateral rectus. From the lateral orbital approach, I start seeing the uh, region, middle of the orbital fat. The orbital fat can be really annoying but once you get friendly with it, uh, things uh, get better. I'm opening the lesion just to make sure that inside. Now I'm taking the tumor completely out. Okay, that's it. So the post-operative MRI is beautiful and the patient did very well. So these are the post-operative pictures and we can see that we have done a good uh, approach and a good reconstruction here. With good cosmetic appearance. And all. Some people think that orbital tumors or orbital surgery is for ophthalmologists. My answer to this is no. Traditionally, historically, orbital surgery is the domain of a neurosurgeon. Yes, there are things that can be done by the ophthalmologists, the oculoplastic surgeons, the things that we said, transconjunctival and chill approaches, 
you don't need to do craniotomy. And the lesions I've showed you, the orbital apex lesion that we have seen in this lady, that can only be done through craniotomy. With this, I finish and I thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sabea, excellent. Uh, we have some people here that I think would want to ask some questions or comments. Okay, the floor is open. Uh, if you want to ask your questions directly or just post them in the chat, whichever you prefer. Um, okay. Don't be shy. People are a little shy with this technology, uh, Dr. Sabea, yeah, yeah, cool. as you know. Oh, there you go. Okay. Go ahead, Uday. Uday, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. So any cases of uh, CSF leak and what will be the management in such cases? Sorry, I did not get to your question. So any cases of CSF leak in such cases and what will be the management of them? Yeah, so CF leak CSF and leak. such, yeah, CSF leak in those cases and how do you manage it? Yeah, I did not have any CSF leak in these uh, pure orbital lesions. Uh, but one case which I showed you the extension of the tumor uh, from the pituitary origin that went into all parts of the orbit, I had a CSF leak and I managed it with the lumbar drain. Okay, okay Wasif Malik asks, what was the histopathology of the second case? Cavernoma. Okay. So both cases were Cavernomas. Okay. Hello, Brahim. Go ahead, Maurice, Hello. go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, Maurice. Hello, Brahim. Um, thank you, thank you. Hello, Brahim. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Thank and I concur with you about uh, Dr. Anton Tarazi. He was a great uh, guy. I managed to work with him when I first came back from London. He's really superb. Uh, my very good presentation. What I missed actually some of the, I was distracted for a bit. So in your series, have you had any tumors as such or any medical um, uh, cases where you had these orbital tumors? And have you ever come across uh, cases where it wasn't a tumor? And is there, uh, as far as you know, do we know whether, um, what's the best imaging that we can differentiate between a tumor and the pseudo tumor or um, sarcoid or whatever. Um, yeah. Is that, for example, you said PET MRI, but I think PET MRI, we don't have that at the moment. But I don't know whether internationally is that proving to be any use. Absolutely. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, Maurice, as uh, everybody knows, is a very senior neurologist. He's one of the top people in the Middle East and uh, he's stationed here in Amman and in London. And uh, he's a great friend of mine. I'm proud to be friends with Maurice. And uh, thank you for the comments about Dr. Antoine Tarazi. I think he's a model. He's a symbol of Jordan. Uh, the dedication and the, the high standard he achieved, he gave us. So we are standing on the shoulder of uh, such a great people who gave us this uh, depth of history of a neurosurgery. So when, when Antoine Tarazi was a, a neurosurgeon back in 63, 61 when he used to come from Jerusalem to Amman, managing both countries, Palestine and Jordan, uh, there were only three or four neurosurgeons in the whole of the Middle East. So this is a, a pride for Jordan. Now your question is, uh, why did I mention about the cases that did not need surgery? Yes, and that's why I put this very vast uh, differential diagnosis because not everything in the orbit is a tumor. And if you are carrying a uh, uh, a knife, then everything needs to be to be incised. And the answer is no. If you study well the picture, if you take, and you are a very good history taking uh, technician, the, the diagnostician, uh, good history taking. By the way, Maurice takes one hour taking history of patients, and I, I love that on him. Uh, taking good history of the patient, really examining him well, and the um, uh, history would give you the clue in ninety percent of cases. And then comes the examination, gives you about 8%. Images just have a value of 2%. So going through this system, this algorithm will give you the clue. But cases that you suspect they are uh, through the tumor of the orbit, then uh, the treatment is medical. There's no need for any surgery. If we think that this case which I presented was a case of histocytosis, there was no need for surgery and so on and so forth. So yes. I had three cases of pseudo tumor and they were treated medically without need for surgery. But again, if one put a good algorithm of good history taking, 
with physical reading the the the, the, the um, uh, images and so on. As for your question, which is the best image? I think it's a combination of CT scan and MRI, and sometimes you need to take a biopsy if you are in that. Do you do a PET scans uh, on, on yes. these routinely? Yes, not routinely. If you, you know, if we have a really difficult uh, uh, situation where the diagnosis is not clear, then yes, we do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Maurice. Okay, we have someone asking a question, Doctor. How do you reconstruct the roof of the orbit? Yeah. Uh, uh, if one reads the papers of uh, Joseph Maroon, he would tell you this. Uh, you don't need to reconstruct the roof of the orbit unless you really have a great uh, bony removal and you have really evaluated the periorbit. But most of the time, you don't need to do any reconstruction. If there is need in the cases in which there is a major bony uh, damage and periorbital damage, then you can put some surgical, so put some fascia, just to prevent the pulsations of the brain to go into the brain the position of the brain to go into the orbit. And sometimes we can use uh, um, titanium mesh to uh, cover the roof of the orbit. But I rarely had to do that. Very good. OK, next question or comment? I'm sure there are some. So step Hi, up. Go Professor, ahead. Go ahead, Alabash. This is uh, Abilash from Tampa. Thank you. That was a really wonderful talk. Uh, my question is regarding fibrous dysplasia of the sphenoid wing. Do you, uh, do you uh, if you have a patient that does not have uh, any involvement of the optic canal, uh, do you take the opportunity to decompress the canal while you're there, uh, if there is sure. some involvement? Yeah. Uh, the answer to this is, as you know, fibrous dysplasia is you will not be able to take them completely surgically. But the concept is that if you take much of the tumor out, then the rest of the tumor will remain consistent for a very, very long time. Uh, most of these patients will present with visual uh, changes, and for those, you must drill the optic canal open. And I showed you one case of mine, this young boy from Iraq with this uh, extensive fibrous uh, dysplasia. Sometimes you, people do it just for cosmetic reasons. I don't believe this is a good, uh, good uh, indication at all. Okay, is that, is that answer your question, Abilash? Yes, yes. Okay. And, and also one more question. What is the risk of uh, frontalis branch injury in lateral orbitotomy? Is that something to uh, consider when you make your incision? Sorry, uh, injury to what? Uh, injury to the frontalis branch of the facial nerve? Yes, yeah, yeah, of course it is. It is there if you are not careful. You know, you, the ways of the, uh, preserving the frontal branch of the uh, facial nerve is either when you reach the pad of fat that you go underneath and take it completely uh, uh, anterior and lateral, or you go interfacial between the superficial and the deep facial. But the frontal branch of the facial is very important and cosmetically it's bad to injure. I uh, fortunately I did not have uh, any uh, frontal uh, facial, uh, frontal branch of the facial injury, except when, when I was a resident. I was in a hurry, I was doing extradural hematoma I was really an enthusiastic resident back in London, and I the, the boy came back with the frontal, and I still remember him because it is the only case of a frontal uh, branch of facial injury I had. Thank you. Very good. Okay, next comment or question, please. I say this all the time. Don't be shy. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Can I ask you. a question? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, it was an excellent presentation, Professor Abraham, and uh, uh, really uh, uh, it was uh, vividly explained because I, I assume that this intraorbital tumor has so many or differential diagnoses that uh, when to operate, whether to operate or not, this becomes a main question that comes into our mind usually. Hmm. And uh, sir, uh, uh, can, I, uh, can I share my screen to uh, sure. show some sure. of my some of my images That's that uh, really made us uh, some uh, difficult time for us whether to offer surgery to this young lady or not. I'm, I'm trying to share my screen, sir. Okay. This is what makes this technology great. Sure. Input by showing your case. Uh, 
are my images available? Uh, they, they're images? coming. Yes, they're coming. Yes, perfect, perfect, perfect. So this uh, this is a young uh, young girl about uh, 20 years of age presented with only ipsilateral headache and uh, some sort of vertiginous sensation onto her right side of uh, mainly towards the right side. So she presented to a, a general physician who asked them to meet me, and then I got this scan, sir. The scan was showing like this, sir. This is the first image. And I'm not able to okay. move this image. That's OK. It's difficult with the iPhone. <laughs> How to move this image now? <coughs> That's okay, just start again. Just, um, okay. Okay. Is that the right image? Well, this is the, uh, I'm not able to show the series of the images. Uh, how to do the series of images being shown. Okay, perhaps we'll just move on then, unfortunately. But we'll learn this technology. Th this instrument is important to the neurosurgeon. <laughs> you want to try it again? Yes, sir. Okay. So can, uh, uh, so, uh, Professor Abraham, can you see these images? Not yet, not yet. You had them before, so. Um, okay, well, we may have to move on here, Uday, unfortunately. Uh, sir, I'm able to see those images. Uh, Not yet. Go, go ahead. Give it another shot. There you go. Whoop, fell off again. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. We'll give it one more try, okay? Okay, sir. Um, okay. 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 Yes. I think we got so it. Actually, so these were some of the images, sir. I can. I'm not able to show. I have got a couple of more images, but uh, every time I have to get back to the screen, stop sharing screen, and then I have to show it, sir. Uh, this this mass was lying exactly. This is intraconal mass but not arising from the optic nerve, neither it was a meningioma, nor it was a sort of coming from uh, involvement of any of the interconal, uh, uh, the sixth nerve was lying away from the mass. So uh, I discussed with my radiologist and they came out to be that it may be some of the uh, thrombosis varices. So I was not able to uh, make a clear cut diagnosis and uh, how to proceed with this case. We're losing the voice a little bit. Could you repeat that today? I don't think we got that. Okay. Okay, we're gonna move on. Okay, Uday? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sabaya. Back to you. And any more comments, questions from the panelists? Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sabaya, uh, for uh, the informative presentation as usual. I'm Dr. Rani from Sudan, and I have a question about the approaches. Uh, in fact, uh, you chose a trional approach. Uh, in fact, I was expecting to see uh, orbitozygomatic or modified orbitozygomatic. Uh, what are the uh, the the things that uh, will, uh, will will lead to choose the uh, orbitozygomatic rather than uh, trional or vice versa. Uh, if there is any also nuances in these uh, choices, thank you. Uh, you can approach the orbit uh, from the neurosurgical point of view through the trional approach, and you can modify that into frontal orbitozygomatic and so on and so forth. I used to do that in the past when things were, you know, uh, started in the whole world that this was a trend 
to do these major skull based approaches. Uh, but I found gradually that I don't need to. Uh, that you can uh, just drilling a little bit of bone, then you can achieve what you want to achieve, other than yes, spending yes. time with the with the with the procedure. So uh, you don't need to do the very sophisticated skull based approaches, uh, but you have to learn how to do them just in case you need to do them. So you need to know how to do the frontal orbitus agromatic, uh, okay. but use it uh, use it sort of um, religiously with 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 care with caution about the uh, length time that you spend and what are the complications for it. Okay, okay. 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 very Thank good, you. very good. Thank you for the question. Uh, the next question or comment, please. Okay, Dave, you're still trying, that's great. <laughs> perseverance. Go, yeah, perseverance, yeah, go ahead. Keep going, the new day. I think uh, you'll get it. Are you still trying, new day? Perhaps not. Okay, uh, more comments or questions from the panelists? Uh, I have a question uh, for Dr. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. What, what, uh, what is your experience with uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 and intraorbital pathology? Is that, uh, uh, apart from optic nerve glioma, uh, what are the other things that, uh, I have a few patients with NF1 that I'm following very closely. One has a uh, neurofibroma causing severe ptosis that I'm, I'm planning to do surgery next week. But uh, um, uh, what is your philosophy and, and have you seen those cases and how do you follow them? Most of the cases that I see of NF2 rather than NF1, but the cases that I've seen of NF1 mostly are coming with optic nerve gliomas. Of course, they can come with so many other lesions, as I said, with the neuroma coming in on, on the roof of the orbit or lateral wall of the orbit from any of the nerves uh, in, that, in that area. But um, unfortunately, I did not have any of these cases, but I had many cases of optic nerve uh, glioma. And as you know, they are classified either into orbital or the canal or intra intracranial, and you can have combination of both. But I had one uh, case which is, I would say this is the severe demonstration of optic nerve glioma. It was involving both optic nerves, optic chasm, and optic, optic tract. So you could see it on the MRI doing this uh, huge extensive tumor. And I have one of the largest uh, optic nerve glioma. Which I presented many times before, but I may present in later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. More comments, questions? Uh, Sarah, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Again. Um, did you face any uh, lesions that extending from the cavernous sinus uh, or vice versa, from the orbit to the cavernous sinus, and how you will manage them? Thank you. Yeah, of course I did. And most of these cases are cases of many germs. Uh, last time, Mr. I think a couple of days ago, we presented the um, supracellular many uh, If you go laterally with the sonoid wing, you have the outer wing, sonoid wing many middle wing sonoid many and then the inner wing sonoid many And then these can go into sphenoid cavernous or sphenoid orbital. So yes, you will see many germs, tumors like many invading the cavernous sinus and going into the orbit. And you have just to tackle them. And I always refer to the uh, words of uh, Professor Roten. He says, who would care, who would love to go to the cavernous sinus? No one would love to go there. But the tumors go there and we will just follow them. The surgery of the cavernous sinus, whatever you may say, whatever anybody may say, it's difficult. It has a, a high degree of complications because of the tight structures there. But it is not anymore a, a blind area that we cannot go to. We can, and we should. Once the tumor go there, we should follow it. So yes, I have seen cases from the orbit going to the cavernous sinus or from the cavernous sinus going to the orbit. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, more questions, comments? Anybody else have experience with uh, these type of tumors they want to share? Um, 
not so far. Okay. No more comments, questions. We're going to close, but we we have of course we have time for more if someone has something useful they want to share. Okay, uh, Dr. Sabea, um, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, and we look forward to your next presentation, which is going to be Monday. Correct? Yes, Monday. Uh, do you like us to start at five so that we'll give time for? The yeah, that's a little better. Time? Yeah, that gives a little more room. Okay, so we'll do it Monday at five o'clock uh, next Monday, and I'll present. Uh, I'm thinking of presenting uh, giant uh, vestibular schwannomas. Okay, very good. We look forward to seeing that. And thank you very much, everybody, for coming and participating. And thanks, Uday, for being bold and trying to share those X-rays. So thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.